All right, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Yeah, Thursday morning, all right. It's good. So um, we have an interesting program again today. A few notes before we get started. This is Ballroom 1 over here. And starting at, uh, at 2 p.m. today, there'll be the LNG demos, so basically open data plane demos. There's four different demos. There's some apps. Uh, both Cisco and Huawei will be demoing. It should be really interesting. We did demos in, in Burlingame in September. They were really terrific, and there was a tremendous turnout. Very interesting. Well, now it's about six months later. The state of the art has advanced with open data play and all that. So starting at 2 o'clock, worth checking it out in Ballroom 1. And then tonight we'll have our gala. It's not a, it's not a formal gala. You can come wearing, of course, anything that you like. Uh, and we're going to have an awards dinner and reception, and we'll have food and drinks, and it's always a fun time. So most people are registered for the gala tonight. Uh, not everyone, so it'd be good. If you're not registered and you're joining us, we'd welcome you to join. Uh, please just go to the registration desk and, uh, and, and put your name in, get, get your name on the list. Um, over at Connects, we've changed the way Friday works from time to time. And so just to let you know that tomorrow we're going to kick off in the same way tomorrow. We have GKH basically is going to give the keynote tomorrow. So same plan, 8.45 start. And Connect closes about 2 o'clock. We wrap it up about 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon on Friday. So just so that you have a heads up on that. So just by a show of hands, how many people know what the difference is at a more detailed level between Android and Android TV? TV and All right. Um, just to give you a little bit of history about myself. I've been working on the smart TV space since the early days of Google TV, which um, that was originally a fork of Android from Honeycomb. Um, through the life of Android TV, uh, of Google TV, uh, we actually started to merge back to mainline Android with the Jelly Bean transition. And um, then early last year, we merged back with Android. So the, the main point is that Android TV is actually Android. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with Android and uh, what I'm going to be explaining is what Android TV is in context of Android. So I do expect um, some knowledge of what Android is. I'm not going to explain all of, all of that. Um, so what we've seen, uh, and we've learned a lot of this through some of the, the pains we had with Google TV, what users are expecting for these kinds of um, consumer electronic devices is that they want to have, um, you know, very simple. Uh, oh, sorry, what happened here? Okay, um, a simple, intuitive UI. Um, they want to have personalization. They want to have 
uh, simple voice input rather than using a keyboard or a remote control with 100 keys on it, which you know, is the original uh, Google TV controls. Some people don't want to have a keyboard in their lap. Uh, they want access to their favorite content, apps, and games. Uh, seamless cloud-based services, and as well, a um, very good uh, cross-device experience. So at Google I.O. last year with Android L, we, it, was, it was a huge launch. And we basically had many different uh, device form factors, which is all part of the same AOSP base, which includes mobile, tablets, auto, wearables, and Android TV. And what's great about this, there's a common set of APIs uh, for developers that work across these different form factors. It's not something completely new to learn. Um, so uh, to go over the six points that I, I mentioned at the beginning, what users are looking for, one is a simple intuitive UI. And in Android TV, we are what's different from uh, the mobile or tablet interface is you're not going to be touching your TV, right? It's not a touch-based experience anymore. So what we've done is we've gone to a very simple card-based UI that is D-pad navigatable. So you just need a D-pad, OK, back, and home. Those are the, the main controls that you need on a remote. And then you can easily go through these uh, rows and select and launch things. And in that uh, top row, which here is called out, we can see that there is some personalization. So based on um, the user's behavior, which can even be cross-device. So let's say I start watching a movie on my tablet. When I go and sit in front of my TV, I can actually pick up where I left off. Um, you know, and it can recommend uh, movies to you, TV shows based on what you're watching. And any application that is the user has installed on their Android TV device can actually offer these types of uh, recommendations in this notifications row. So if I just go back quickly, this top row is kind of our notifications or recommendations row, which any application that's installed on that device can throw up a, uh, a card there. And then further below that, you can see you know, the applications that are installed. And, and the ordering of those is also personalized based on usage. So if you're always using Netflix, that will be on the far left side of that row. And um, something that you know, is, I think, quite powerful, and it's, it's not just device side. It is definitely also powered by our back end. But we have very powerful um, commands you can execute by voice that would be very tedious to enter um, using an on-screen keyboard or even uh, on your lap keyboard. <laughs> so you can make a query here. It may be hard to see, but a user um, picks up the remote or their, their phone. They press the microphone button to talk to their Android TV device, and they say, Oscar-nominated movies from 2007. And then this is able to actually come back and provide a list. Um, and it can actually be a lot more interesting queries as well, like um, you know, romantic comedies with Tom Hanks or something like that. And this can also be used, so the, uh, when a search is ex executed this way, Applications that are installed on the device also have a chance to respond and provide um, you know, responses that would make sense for that query. And of course, users will not be enjoying their device very much if they can't access the content that they want. That's the main uh, reason of using their device. They would just want to get their content, right? And so with Android TV, we I think we have a lot better uh, support from the community to provide this content on our platform. 
And so we already have you know, some great partners. So you have uh, you know, games like Minecraft and um, you know, Hulu and Netflix, Pandora, some you know, must-have apps on the platform. And of course, um, Google has also created experiences specifically for the 10-foot UI of Android TV. So you have the best of our uh, content as well. And you may be aware of Chromecast. It's a very popular and successful device. And you know, what people love about it is you know, it's cheap, but it's also very easy to use. You, just, um, you don't even need a remote. You just, you know, everyone has their smartphone or tablet. Um, and they can just simply cast their content to their screen. Um, and it's not constantly streaming from your mobile device. Right, so it's not using up your battery. Uh, you can walk away, and it will continue to play your content. Um, and this functionality is baked into Android TV. So you don't need an additional Chromecast um, plugged into your Android TV device. It's just included. So um, that's a very compelling use case as well. And for our, uh, you know, to grow the ecosystem of applications and games on Android TV, we've, uh, we've done a lot of work there as well. So one, for games, we've kind of standardized the game controller definition. So not all games are going to be great with a D-pad and OK button only, right? Some games you may want to uh, have a bunch of shoulder buttons and multiple joysticks. So we've created a standard, and any game can basically declare that it requires a game controller. And this game controller can be made by multiple manufacturers, but if it adheres to um, our specifications, then you know, consumers can know that as long as they have this type of compatible controller, they can play all of these games. Um, and so one example at CEO, uh, sorry, at CES, show Razer demonstrated their Forge game console, which is an Android TV device, and they have their own uh, serval controller. Um, the uh, ADT1 that we gave out and also the, um, the Nexus player also have you know, controllers that match this spec. And additionally, games can use uh, Google Play services, so it's easy to uh, you know, keep track of your progress. You can have cloud savings. You can actually be playing a game on your tablet or mobile phone, and then that progress can carry over very easily to on your Android TV. You don't have to start over. Um, and we even have real-time multiplayer can be locally in one place. So with at least a 2 by 2 um, you know, Bluetooth wireless, you can have four simultaneous game controllers active if you're playing together in the same room. Um, you can also do real time where one person is playing on their uh, you know, tablet or smartphone, and the other people are actually playing on the big screen. And um, additionally, since you have this single API across all of your Android form factors, you can have the same application for mobile and tablet working on Android TV with very minor changes, either to support the controller um, or other type of input. One very important point there is that um, when you create your Android manifest, usually that's where you list you know, some requirements. Like you could say, I need a camera. I need this. I need that. Well, there's one specific requirement which is different than all the others, which is saying that you need a touch screen. And that is an implicit requirement. So if you don't actually say explicitly in your Android manifest that you don't require a touch screen, then we assume that you do require a touch screen, which means that your app will be not visible um, on the Play Store to any Android TV device. So that's uh, an important point to remember. OK, and in Android L, one of the many APIs we introduced uh, and the concept is the TV input framework. 
So this is in AOSP, and it is a very important part of Android TV. Now, the uh, many parts of the APIs are actually um, system protected. You need system permission to access it, which means that um, you know some of the APIs can be used by just any developer that is creating an application and uploading to Google Play. Uh, but other applications, you actually have to be the device manufacturer to use. And this is because we are trying to be a little bit conservative, um, protect uh, some of the content uh, experience that, you know, broadcasters are very protective of their experience and, you know, how the content that they're um, broadcasting is shown. If you're familiar with, uh, like, HBB TV and DVB specs, uh, it's quite clear that you should not have, for example, overlays on top of their content. Um, a broadcaster would not be happy if they're showing a program and uh, you're covering their logo, or while an advertisement is playing, you start popping up your own full screen advertisement to replace it, right? And that is something that, um, with the permission model that we've set, is only possible for a device manufacturer to do, which, of course, you would not do as a device manufacturer, otherwise you would probably get blocked or um, in trouble very quickly. We, um, so using that API, well, this is one example. This is a TV application. So to view live TV, change channels, uh, you know, see what's on with the EPG uh, browser, let's say, that is something that only a device manufacturer can make. The app has to be in the system partition uh, to function. And we have created a reference implementation of this code, which uh, we are providing for our partners. It's not currently publicly available, but as a partner uh, creating an Android TV device, you would get access to this code, and you can either um, launch your device with this application as is, or you can feel free to change um, you know, or you could start from scratch, but we would recommend you know to start with our reference. Uh, it'll probably be a lot faster. And again, this is a card-based UI. And you know, this is one of the the problems and and one of the reasons of Android TV and even Google TV is trying to solve this. Okay, if you have a TV but you have multiple inputs, you have you know multiple set-top boxes, what have you connected to your TV, you often end up with a bunch of remotes where you have to to switch between them uh, to control your you know, pay TV box and doing things on your TV and your DVR. And Google TV provided a way to um, control these other devices. And like, we also are doing the same thing with Android TV. I mean, what we really would like is this kind of experience where, you know, Maybe you're just controlling with a very simple remote all of your devices, all of accessing all of your content, and as well, you know, throwing away the hundred buttons or the keyboard, and you can just do voice input for the complicated tasks. All right, so I'm going to start to get a little bit technical. This is the TV input framework. Um, if you want more information, obviously you can look at source code in AOSP. Also, I've worked on documentation on our source.android.com site that talks about TV specifically. You will see this diagram as well as you know, several others. Um, and so let me talk about this. Uh, what I had shown previously is kind of that TV app, which is showing live TV. And the TV app interacts with what we call TV inputs. And so TV inputs are just Android applications that um, either they're pre-installed in the system partition, which I don't know if you can tell the difference between the colors, but the, uh, I guess, blue or cyan here is the um, system partition or system TV input. So these have access to do more things than um, just a third-party developer. Then we have these uh, TV inputs, which I guess are purple. Um, which have less access. So one difference here is that you can see the little locks. Okay, so a TV provider is a content provider, which is going to store all of your EPG data. So your channels, 
your programs, and the relevant um, data for each of those. So when a program starts and ends, description, uh, thumbnail, etc. And the reason why we have these locks is that TV inputs that um, are not part of the system, they only have access to see their own data. This is a, a privacy issue, right? So you may not want a third-party app to be phoning home and, and kind of advertising back what, what um, other channels and programs you're subscribed to, right? Maybe you're subscribed to um, the History Channel and you're ashamed that you know, other people might know that. Uh, and so we basically locked this down that um, a third-party TV input, like let's say this IPTV TV input, can only uh, read and write its own channels and its own programs. Okay, and <clears throat> the uh, device or system applications do not have this limitation, and the reason for that is the TV app can provide system-wide search support, and <clears throat> you know your EPG browser, you will want to show all the channels, all the programs, right? <clears throat> and using the TV input manager service, which is um, a new service we introduced in Android L, the TV app does not need to know about all of these TV inputs in advance. And a user can dynamically install a new TV input, which can add additional channels, which will then show up just as um, you know, first-class citizens, the same as the other channels. <clears throat> for the built-in tuner, for example, you'll just see another channel added on. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and what I think is very exciting about this is it opens up a new business model for um, content providers. So instead of usually being in the B2B model where uh, they're offering their channels to an aggregator, which is then providing that to subscribers, they can actually do B2C and offer their channel directly to subscribers. They can put their channel on it may be a very niche channel. You can upload it, install it, uh, put your app in Google Play, and any user can then install that channel, subscribe to it, and um, it'll just show up and they'll be able to access that as any of their other channels. <clears throat> and something else I'll mention is, uh, <clears throat> so here we have an example where we say, external set-top box, TV input. So I may have a set-top box in my house <clears throat> for my pay TV uh, provider. And let's say the pay TV provider uh, decides to create a TV input application, which can then, within the local area network in the house, uh, talk to that connected uh, set-top box, or maybe through the cloud, talk to the set-top box. And this provides a way that the user could actually control that set-top box through um, Android TV. So you're just using the same D-pad. They could actually interact with that box without having to pull out the second controller. OK, for HDMI, and specifically HDMI CC, <clears throat> you know, Manufacturers have like 20 different names for HMI CC, and their implementations often have inconsistencies with each other, the way that they behave. <clears throat> with Android TV, we've actually done our own Android, uh, HMI CC implementation, which we're providing to all of our partners, and we believe that this will help reduce fragmentation. Now, some manufacturers have, of course, their own custom CEC commands, we do have allowance to um, you know, also add your own custom CC commands and add hooks to basically listen to those and respond to them. So you can have full coverage for your current uh, CC commands. And for the default ones, or the common standard ones, you can rely on our implementation. OK, 
Okay, <clears throat> and um, security is obviously very important for users from an application standpoint. You know, they don't want to have um, essentially malware on their device, on their consumer electronic device. That's something that we care about. We have multiple layers of defense against that. So these are not specific to Android TV. This is just part of the standard Android, the different layers of defense we have. And part of it is that we do have sandbox and permissions for every application um, with runtime security checks. We also allow users to consent to having their apps, if they, if they, even if they sideload an app or use a, another um, app store besides Google Play, we allow them to basically check those applications with Google if it's a known malware app. Um, so you know we're trying to protect um, users. And of course, when people are installing, they can also see what types of permissions that the applications are requesting and then make an informed decision whether or not they want to install that application. Um, <clears throat> and we don't stop there. That's you know, just for application protection. But additionally, uh, we are using SE Linux with Android TV. Um, we also do address space, layout randomization, and uh, Fortify source to protect against buffer exploits, um, hardware cryptography, and you know, we are using uh, permissions as well, so system partition um, to protect certain aspects of uh, what you can do on the device. Another aspect of security is DRM and content providers um, and broadcasters, this is very important to them. You know, you cannot provide their content on your device unless you meet their um, DRM requirements. And this is, some parts of this are not specific to Android TV, it's just Android itself has this pluggable DRM framework where you can create your own DRM modules and include those. <clears throat> But we do have some minimum requirements as part of our, um, what we call CDD or compatibility device uh, definition that means that and every Android TV must provide um, this type of DRM support, which means that application developers, content providers can feel confident that there will not be fragmentation um, that you know, only some of the Android TV devices can play their content. So they can feel confident that all of these devices will. <clears throat> and one uh, very important one is we support dash common encryption as well. Okay, so that is kind of the overview. And um, for a lot of specific questions, I'd like to handle those um, after the keynote, if you could uh, you know, just find me outside. But if there's any questions about the TV input framework specifically, I'm happy to answer those now. Sure. Sultan? Or? So I have a question. Uh, oh. Wait for the mic. Okay. Thank you. So I have a question regarding to resource management through the TV input framework. So through the TV input framework, you basically are uh, interfacing different pieces of hardware that the OEM can provide, single tuner, multiple tuner. And those resources can be used for various purposes, like uh, video playback or fetching the EPG. Uh, how, how you're managing, you know, uh, the resource allocation, the hardware allocation between different applications. Is there, you know, a specific module that uh, sets a priority between them that, you know, uh, fetching, when we are fetching the EPG over the tuner, then the video playback is disabled, or uh, do you have a solution for that? So <clears throat> in Google TV, we did provide a resource manager that provided a framework to do this, and we have not carried that over to Android TV. 
Um, so some of our partners that were with us since Google TV, they basically used that as a model for themselves and their Android TV uh, efforts. But it's essentially up to each um, manufacturer how they're going to do that for their resources. Thank you. So you showed how you can do voice search for applications, movies, et cetera. And then with the TV input framework, you can make all sorts of content available. The user doesn't know that one was HDMI, one came from their satellite box, et cetera. Is your search, voice search, integrated for the TV content as well as the other kind of Google um, search type things like the EPG metadata can be searched equally as well as um, other information for you know content or applications? Thank you. Yes, so our, um, our search does request against our back end. So we have a, a kind of knowledge graph of information about casts and whatnot, which can return um, specific programs or movies. But additionally, we're sending a broadcast intent on the device so that other applications, including the device manufacturer's TV application, can then respond with um, their own search results. Concerning content protection, um, conditional access provider are, are key player in this ecosystem. How do you intend to deal with that? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Um, concerning content protection, conditional access provider are key player in this ecosystem. How do you plan to integrate this? Okay, so you're asking, asking about conditional access integration? <clears throat> so, Conditional access integration is possible with Android TV. It's not, um, it's not part of the framework that it, there's a, you know, a simple hook to do that, but we have partners that have integrated it. Um, I can give you more details separately. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much.